Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Well, let me re-read that passage from Exodus chapter 3 that we read in the, during the first section of worship. This story of Moses' encounter with God uh, at a bush that was burning and, but not consumed. Exodus 3, 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. And often in the Old Testament, fire is a symbol of the presence of God. In fact, throughout Scripture, a sign and evidence of the manifest presence of God. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. So in some ways in the initial stages, Moses seems unaware of what this strange sign is, what is happening. It's not dawned on him that this is a manifestation of God's presence. I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, from within the bush, Moses, Moses. I love that. God is always taking the first step towards you. Always. Calling your name. Maybe there's evidences and signs that you've not yet recognized as God, just like Moses, but God is calling you. By name. Such is his love. And then Moses' response, Moses said, here I am. That, that, that's your part in this drama. <laughs> when God, who seeks and looks and loves you, calling your name, the response is, here, here I am. And then, and then God says, don't come any closer. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Now we're going to think about that just in a few moments. A holy place. The approaching of God is a, a holy matter. Beautiful but holy. Then God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. It's like God was revealing himself to Moses. In fact, in just a few verses' time, he will reveal more of himself, even his very name, when he says, I am who I am. I'm I'm God. I am who I am. It's the story of God taking the first step towards us, towards Moses, calling us by name, longing for the response, "Here, here I am, Lord. And then bringing revelation to him. This is who I am. A holy moment in a holy place. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. That fear of the Lord, that awe of God, that reverence for God, such an awareness of the holy presence of God that it was almost as if he he couldn't look, so he was bowed low. Friends, that's never a bad place to be. A healthy fear of the Lord. You know, I love a good fire. I, um, I've probably had more fires in the four years that I've been up here in Perth than, than I have the, the rest of my life. Uh, for some reason, fires in Glasgow just don't seem to go the same as fires in Perth. I don't know what it is. I, I love the beauty of them. They're almost therapeutic fires. There's a comfort. There's a warmth. By the way, I'm not going around the place lighting fires just in case you're worried about you know, watching for the newspaper. But there's something beautiful, drawing, comforting about fire. Uh, there's something guiding about it. In the old days, they would have torches that would be fire that would help to lead and guide them, show them the way. But fire is also powerful, unpredictable, even dangerous. And so the association with God and fire is not to be 
misunderstood. It is both comforting and welcoming and warming and leading and guiding, almost therapeutic, I would say. But it's also powerful, unpredictable, even dangerous, handled with care. And, and one of the pictures of God in the scriptures is holy fire. God's glory and presence is fire. Fire that welcomes, leads, assures, comforts. But fire that can be dangerous, unpredictable. It has potential to burn, to consume. But also to consume in ways that purifies. Something about the fire of God that can burn away the things that pollute in our lives. Holy fire. It has potential to burn, consume, purify. And so how we approach God matters. And that's why we're thinking about the holy fear of the Lord. And on one hand, this passage really captures God's desire to take that first step towards us in revealing himself to us, to Moses. In, in verse 3, 6, and then verse 3, 14, he's revealing who, I, who he is. I'm the God of your father, Abraham, fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am who I am. He's showing himself, revealing himself to Moses in the same way that he longs to reveal himself to you. But on the other hand, our approach to him, to understand him, to draw close to him, to understand that he is holy, like holy fire, then Moses must recognize that he's on holy ground as he approaches the God of his fathers, Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob, the one who says, I am who I am. Moses was standing on holy ground. You know, every time we approach God, we stand on holy ground. And God gave Moses instructions on how to approach. Moses, take off your shoes. Now, what does that mean? Because it's, it's come to mean for us. Most of us would understand this as a, an act of submission. It's, it's recognizing this is holy, and so Moses is doing something in obedience. But what might that act of taking off sandals, removing his sandals, really mean in the time of Moses? Well, I read an article uh, in, uh, online from uh, someone called Leah Martin. She captured some of the ideas. I like the ideas that she, she had of what this might mean. But removing his sandals demonstrates, first of all, obviously, Moses' reverent obedience. If that's what God says, if that's what the holy God says, if that's what the holy, to approach the God of holy fire, if that's what he says, that's what I'll do. I will assume a posture, whatever posture he asks, this posture of reverence and reverent obedience. Even in Moses' unprepared state and station. Now, if you don't know the story of Moses, Moses had, when he was a baby, was released by his family, his mother, because there was a threat against the life of every male-born son in Egypt. And Moses had just been born. And in an act of faith and trust in God, rather than having Moses taken from her, Moses' mother released him to God and into the river. And his journey was that he would move in this little basket down the river and would find a destination right outside Pharaoh's palace where he would be welcomed in. He was a Hebrew but he was then welcomed into the Egyptian palace. But he was separated from his family. What's more, as he grew up in the palace and as he began to have some authority, as he began to understand what his history was, as he learned, as he watched the oppression of his own people who had become slaves under Pharaoh, his stepfather, as his rule exerted pain and suffering on his own people, 
the Hebrews. Then Moses took the law into his own hands, even to murder. And in an act of rage, kills an Egyptian soldier who was taking it out on, his, on the Hebrews. He flees and spends years in the wilderness. And then suddenly, as he's out tending flocks, God approaches him. Let me tell you, friend. I don't care. Well, I do care where you've been and what you've gone through. I do. But it doesn't matter where you've been and what you've come from. God was still calling Moses' name and he's still calling yours. Whatever pattern your life has been since birth is no obstacle or barrier to God's longing for you and he's still calling your name. And in Moses' unprepared state and station, God still calls to him. And even in his advanced years, God calls. And putting off his sandals was a token of obedience and respect and submission, even though he knew he didn't deserve any of it. Some scholars consider that removing shoes signifies putting off the earthly and unholy on approaching the one who is truly holy. And that's what the Old Testament priests did. They would take off their shoes before going into the holy place because they were entering the place of God. They were shedding all that was earthly and unholy, whatever it might be, so that they could approach the holy one. Removing his shoes could signify a forfeiting of comforts and rights. A symbol of all that we have. A willingness to surrender it, past, present, and future, to the God who equips. And then this last one that Leah Martin mentions, I find quite moving. It also symbolizes taking off his shoes before entering a home. That after being rejected by the Hebrews and the Egyptians and wandering as a stranger and a foreigner, that this was an image and a sign of God's presence and that Moses was coming home again. Coming home back to God. What a beautiful picture. This one obedient act and response to God so that he might approach well the holy God. Reverent obedience. Putting off the earthly and unholy so that we can approach the holy coming and forfeiting our past, present, and future, our rights and our comforts, just to be with God, that we might find our way home to him. And this obedience, this holy fear led Moses home to God. His approach to God as holy fire mattered. Now, here's some other places in Scripture where fire is the metaphor or the image or the sign of God's presence. We, we have Moses at the burning boots here in Exodus 3. Then we have uh, God appearing as cloud by day and fire by night in Exodus 13 and 14. When the Israelites, the Hebrews, leave their slavery, when finally Pharaoh says, let them go, take them. And Moses leads them out of Egypt and towards the promised land as they're heading towards the Red Sea. God leads them by a cloud in the day and a pillar of fire by night. That fire of God, a sign of his presence, leading and guiding and guarding God's people. Holy fire, casting out or carving out a fresh and holy way. Or fire on Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, uh, verses 16 through to 19, we have these words on the screen. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning. This is when Moses was meeting God on Mount Sinai with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. 
everyone in the camp trembled, the fear of the Lord. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. This holy presence of God. What else to do but bow low? The fire of God, God's presence and God's glory had to be veiled. For Moses, it was in fire in a, in a bush burning. On Mount Sinai, it was the glory of God, the presence, the manifest presence of God, even shrouded, veiled in a cloud of smoke as he appeared in fire. And the response of the people was bow low. But here's a, here's, here's a challenging one. From Leviticus 10, verses 1 to 3, a, a picture of consuming fire. Let's go to this verse that's on the screen. Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. What had happened? They'd become complacent in their approach to God. They disregarded how they were to approach the holy God. They had lost any sense of fear of the Lord. They had become so apathetic about it that the way they went about it, although it was documented for all who were in this office, they did what was contrary. So fire came from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Now, I know these are difficult passages for us to get a handle on. It seems almost incredible. What I do want to say is, this doesn't happen that often. It does have a ring about Acts chapter 5 about it. That's where all this started, wasn't it? A few weeks ago, when we went to Acts chapter 5, and Ananias and Sapphira um, are fall stone dead because they were lying to God, deceptive before God as well as to the people. I mean, there are times where the glory and the holiness of God is so present in a place that it cannot even contain itself. And so when unholiness appears, it has consequences. And they were consumed. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. And Aaron remained silent. I'm not sure what else there was to say. It's lovely to think of the therapy of a fire, but my goodness, it's dangerous. And this, this sense of the holy fear of the Lord is not that we might have a spirit of fear, but that we'd think about the seriousness of our life of worship and our approach to God. This is reminiscent of Acts 5. What seems to be an unfortunate error is un used to unveil a more troubling attitude or posture before God, one of complacency, comfort, ease, commonplace. This is no commonplace matter, approaching God. There was even an arrogance about it, an entitlement, a lack of thought, consideration, awe or reverence, when in fact we're approaching the holy God, holy fire. And again, all of this builds our sense of holy awe and holy fear of the Lord. Not to paralyze us, but to remind us of the one that we approach, who invites us, who calls us by name, but invites us to bow in obedience, in reverence, in holy awe. This is God. And isn't it interesting that wherever the fullness of God's glory, wherever he's manifesting the fullness of his glory, there has to be some covering, some limitation, something around to cover the glory because it, it's so great, so powerful, it's so strong that we wouldn't be able to stand in this life in it, his presence, that full glory of God. And so it's a bush, it's the sky, it's the cloud, it's a tent or a temple 
the holy of holies where God resides in his full presence. Because when unrestrained and unleashed and unveiled, God's glory is serious and dangerous and consuming just like fire. Remember the one that we approach. Our approach matters to God. Holy fire shapes our approach to God. And then we move into the New Testament. And there's a different type of veiling of the glory of God. It's the arrival of Jesus. The glory of God veiled in human flesh. God himself coming to earth. Here's what John 1.14 says. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. God's glory now revealed but still veiled now in flesh in Jesus. And then it would be God's glory come in the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We'll come to that in a minute. But God's glory now veiled in Jesus. John the Baptist speaking about Jesus, Matthew 3, 11, we read, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with what? With the Holy Spirit and fire. Fire. Jesus now comes as the glory of God veiled in human flesh. Again, meeting people, he comes to us. God has always taken the first step towards us, friends. That we might respond to the holy God. Bend low. To approach Jesus, the son of the living God. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But there's a huge shift that takes place in the New Testament. And it takes place on the cross of Christ. Now, one of the places where uh, God's glory was present in its fullness was in what I called the, mentioned to you earlier, the Holy of Holies, that inner section of the temple. And in order for the priests to enter that place, they had to go through all kinds of rituals that would take them from the outer courts to the inner courts to the to, uh, to eventually the holy of holies, where they would be in the very manifest presence of God. And there was a curtain that separated all the other places from that holy dwelling of God. But there's something changing in the coming of Jesus, who in glory, veiled in flesh, is present amongst people. He's touched by unclean humanity. Literally, we'll see that in a little moment. But in his death on the cross, do you remember this happening? Matthew 27, 51. At the moment of Jesus' death, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That curtain that separated us, even the priests, from that presence of God was torn apart. For God was now marching out of that holy place that he might be more present, tangibly present with his people in ways that would not consume them. But that in the life and life of Jesus, that even in the fullness of his glory, he was touching and being touched by the uncleanness of humanity but he was bringing about purity and healing and forgiveness and mercy and grace and compassion to those who approached and bowed low. And then Pentecost, tongues of fire were resting upon them. A new wave of God's presence in our lives received as they bowed low in prayer before God. What does consuming holy fire look like in Jesus? 
It is consuming fire, consuming holiness, but in a new way. And so I want us to read through a passage of scripture in Mark chapter 5. Words will be in the screen. Two encounters, two approaches to God, two approaches to Jesus. Glory veiled in human flesh. What does consuming holiness and fire look like in Jesus in this new way? Let's read from Acts, uh, from Mark 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was still by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders, okay, we'll just stop there. This is dangerous. For this synagogue leader, Jairus, this is dangerous. His approach to God is dangerous. His approach to Jesus is dangerous. Because already there was a conflict between the religious leaders in the synagogue and Jesus. He was putting his reputation, his neck on the line. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. What, what a bold, brave, but desperate approach, longing. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. I mean, he didn't even know Jesus that much, but, but he knew that this was the Holy One of God. And so what did he do? He fell low on his feet. <laughs> what an approach to Jesus, the Son of Glory. He fell at his feet. Humility. There was danger, but he falls in humility. He pleaded earnestly with Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she will be healed and live. There was an urgency, a longing, and there was an act of faith. Sometimes I wonder, how much is my worship really an act of faith? A longing, a desperate, urgent longing for God? Or just a turn up and sing? whether I'm on my own or whether I'm with you. But in this potential threat of danger, he falls at his feet, humility. He expresses urgency and longing for Jesus and deep faith. Just come and then she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went. What an approach. A large crowd followed and pressed around him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. You might wonder what's, apart from the fact that's an awful situation to be in, why is that important? Well, because in the world of Jewish law, when a woman is in her time of bleeding, then she must refrain from any contact with any other, and especially with the temple or the place of worship or sacrifice. And then after her seven days, and there's a ritual of cleansing and purity, they would then be allowed to enter back into ordinary life again. Now, I know that in our day, we see things much differently, but this is how it was then. Well, this woman had had that for 12 years nonstop. She was isolated from social life, spiritual life, religious life. She was on her own. She was unclean. So she had to live an isolated life. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So not only was she facing social, spiritual, physical isolation because of her uncleanness, she was also suffering. There's pain, there's sorrow. And she'd spent all her money. She was poor and she wasn't getting any better. She was hopeless. What a picture of uncleanness and hopelessness. But when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him and in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. If I can just touch his cloak, not even a part of his body, just his cloak. Now, now the, in, in Matthew's account of this, he talks about she touched the hem of his garment. And there's significance in that. The hem of, of a garment in, in first century Judaism was significant. It, they would be, depending on what it was on, what was on it, would determine a person's identity or authority. 
but also on them would have been a, a little blue tassel, almost like a prayer tassel. And tassels on a Jewish prayer shawl are worn on garments were really a sign of God's presence and who they were as the people of God. There's a prophecy about Jesus from Malachi 4.2. It says this, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. Healing in his wings. And that phrase was often used of the tassel, the hem of the garment that would be on the Messiah. And this woman in all her uncleanness, longing just to touch Jesus, goes for the hem of the garment, the tassel, the longing for the wings of healing. Man, and she has to be bowing low to get to that hem. Do you see the posture, the approaches to Jesus, the King of glory? And she was freed from her suffering. That exercising of faith again. And she found her freedom. At once Jesus realized that power had gone out of him. Note the flow of this consuming holiness was now consuming any uncleanness and any illness. Her posture in the touching of the hem of his garment as a sign of faith in, sp in spite of her uncleanness, she was now the recipient of the outward flow of the consuming holiness and fire of God that brought her healing and cleanness and freedom. The glory of God veiled in flesh now releasing consuming holiness that consumes our uncleanness and brings our healing. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you. His disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the old truth. And he said to her, and can you imagine after all these 12 years of being isolated and cut off and, and being with no one and being nothing and being uh, separated and looked down upon. But Jesus said to her, daughter. She'd been, she would have been isolated from her family, neglected, sent away, separated. And in this moment, Jesus looks at her and says, daughter. Your faith, your approach, the way you came to me as evidence of your true faith, that has made you well. It's the way she approached. And his consuming holiness, that same fire, that made her well and clean and whole. Well, you remember how this story started? It started with Jairus, the synagogue leader. I mean, he, what, he, he's standing thinking, we've got to get to my daughter. I asked you to come to my daughter and you're dealing with this unclean woman. And, is she unclean? She just touched Jesus. You're not supposed to touch the rabbi. You're not supposed to touch the synagogue leader or the religious leader when you're unclean. But, but she's clean. Why? Her posture of faith, the way she approached Jesus and her humility, her faith, her longing. So that actually Jesus' glory and power brought her cleansing and healing the way she approached. But while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and they said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, just believe. He didn't let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. 
but they laughed at him. She had been pronounced dead. The mourners, the professional mourners, had been called because she was dead. But Jesus put them all out, and after he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with them, and he went in where the child was laid. Now, again, we have to understand that those, the body of that person who had died becomes immediately unclean. Religious leaders cannot touch the body. But Jesus is the author and perfecter of life, the king of all glory. And he enters that place and he lays hands on the unclean, on the body of death. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother, the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand, clean, touching, unclean, and said to her, Talita kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And at this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. He touched the unclean, the dead, and brought them to life again. The Father's approach to the holy fire. Humble, longing, desperate. Two approaches to God, to Jesus that bear an example for us. But there's something that's happening in the life of Jesus that in closer proximity to Jesus, our unholiness is consumed and we are being made holy. Our uncleanness is being purified. Our illness our healing is coming. Proximity to Jesus. Indeed, if you read the scriptures well, you'll discover that things become whole and holy as they are in closer proximity to God. Things, items, articles, even people, even ground are made holy, not because someone says they're holy, but because God is present. And when we approach the holy God in the right posture, we too will be made holy, being changed from glory to glory. Holy fire in the initial thought of it all seems like a place not to enter, but it's how we enter and encounter the holy fire of the glory of God that makes all the difference. And both this synagogue leader Jairus and this unclean woman understood how to approach the holy God consuming fire and holiness rather than separate or violate or profane or tarnished by the unclean then Jesus is now being consumed by his fire and holiness some of us think we're not good enough some of us thinks we've done things that God couldn't possibly deal with. These stories remind us that no matter what our story has been, just like Moses, God is still calling us by name to enter the holy places with him. How will you approach as he calls you by name in holy awe and holy fear, understanding the holy God so that we might be drawn nearer. I had the worship team to come up. Oh, that we might know and understand the holy glory fire of God, not to keep you away, but to draw you near to the fire of God. As you respond in humility, bowing low, this is what we need. This is what God says we need. If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves. Humble themselves. That's what we need in Scotland. We need a humbling of ourselves. I need it. I need to be humbling myself. To draw close to the holy God, the holy fire. And if only we could grasp the great holiness of God 
that would draw us near. Oh, how that would change our worship as we move towards him. So let me finish with three quotes or readings. First from Teresa of Avila. Before prayer and worship, endeavor to realize whose presence you are approaching and to whom you are about to speak. Be keeping in mind whom you are addressing. Let me just leave that for you to think about as we enter into a moment of worship again. Holy fire, our approach to God matters. How will you approach? Before prayer and worship, endeavor to realize whose presence you're approaching and to whom you're about to speak, keeping in mind whom you are addressing. In a second, from Joy Dawson, Bible teacher, missionary, author. When we see him face to face in all his awesome holiness and blazing glory, it will seem incredible to us that we ever had a casual thought in relation to him. Wow. When we see him face to face in all his awesome holiness, and blazing glory, it will seem incredible to us that we ever had a casual thought in relation to him. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And then finally from St. Francis of De Sales. We must fear God out of love, not love him out of fear. And for those of us who feel like all of this is stirring up within you a spirit of fear, that is not the work of God. The work of God is to lead you in love, to fear him, to recognize who he is, and out of that place of love, to fear him in awe and reverence. How will you approach the holy God he lives in holy fire. Would you stand with me? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, as you did when you walked the streets, as you moved through the crowds, as they reached out to you, longing, desperate for you, hungering in humility, thirsting for you, believing in faith, that you would be able to do what they could not do, even in their uncleanness. If only I could get to touch the hem of his garment, then I would be well, clean, healed, forgiven, whatever it might be. Oh, reach out, people of God. Bow low. Come to holy fire, the fire of God. Recognize who he is before you enter the place of prayer. Not to stop you, but to remind you of how we enter the holy place where God dwells and his presence is real. We bow before you. Lord, as we do so in these moments, let grace abound to us. For those of us who are carrying things even now in our inner being that seem to be saying, you can't go, you can't come, it's not for you. You're not worthy. Lord, by your grace and come and dispel the lie and bring your truth. You came full of glory in grace and truth. Bind up the lies. Speak the truth. Come in grace to your people as we humble ourselves before the living God. In Jesus' name, amen.